Yeah, because I'm going to have to run as soon as it's over. So uh, to, to go teach. Um, but yeah, so I guess I, I should just start then. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this talk is about um, the connection between what we've seen so far in the course and uh, torque degenerations, which is, uh, I think, sort of a new uh, direction for the mini course. So I'm going to try to give you some idea of what that is about. Um, and uh, I was listening to Yen Peng's talk uh, over in Global Poisson, and I think this is roughly the moral of, of uh, what we're trying to say um, in this paper in some, in some sense, uh, which is that uh, you should think of canonical bases as being the representation theory analog of action yeah, angle. Right? Uh, by which I mean just something very simple and naive, right? Canonical bases are, are a nice uh, decomposition of a representation into one dimensional subspaces. So they're like coordinates on the representation. They have many nice properties and action angle coordinates are coordinates on a symplectic or Poisson manifold. So this is just something very simple. In any, in, in any event, so the, this talk is going to be about a paper that was joint work with Benjamin Hoffman. Um, so the archive link is here, uh, and it would be great if you could take a look at that. So let's start with uh, let's start with the the basics. This is just some some Kähler geometry, uh, and this slide is going to be the underpinning of the rest of the talk. But I'm not going to use much of the notation. So if you have some smooth Kähler manifold, uh, so with symplectic form omega, complex structure J, Riemannian metric G, and you have a holomorphic submersion uh, from X to C then you can write the real and imaginary parts of this map as F and H. And for F and H, now they're real valued functions. And so you can take their gradient and Hamiltonian vector fields with respect to the Riemannian structure and the symplectic structure. So that's the formula is defining those vector fields. And because this is a holomorphic map, it follows uh, from the Cauchy-Riemann equations that these two vector fields satisfy the following relation. So the gradient of the real part is minus the Hamiltonian vector field of the imaginary part. That's something that you can check for yourself as a nice exercise. Um, now, what we can do, and this is kind of the magic of everything that follows, is define something called a gradient Hamiltonian vector field, which I'm going to denote V sub pi. And it's given by this formula. And it's called a gradient Hamiltonian vector field because, as you can see, you can define it using either the gradient or the Hamiltonian. So let's call the flow of this vector field uh, phi sub t. And you might be wondering why we have this normalizing factor in the, in the denominator of this vector field. And there's a very simple reason for that. It makes the vector fields flow have this very nice property that if you start with some point x here in the fiber over z, then the flow will take you to a point in the fiber over z minus t if you flow for time t. So the reason I don't like to use this, um, this pad for talks is that my computer gets very slow if I try to write. So I'm not gonna be able to write too much, um, but roughly you have a commuting diagram like this. Uh, something to mention maybe is that because uh, pi is a holomorphic submersion, all the fibers are regular, which means they're co-dimension one complex submanifolds. Um, and a complex submanifold of a Kähler manifold is a Kähler submanifold. So all these fibers are actually Kähler. And then, so they have a, a symplectic structure on them. And the other thing that's interesting about this map, phi sub t, is that as a map from the fibers to the fibers, 
it's actually a symplectic map. Um, so this is also something that you can check. It's a little bit trickier than the, the previous two exercises, um, but it's just some, some basic uh, differential calculus. Um, however, because we add this normalizing factor, this means that in general, phi sub t is not a symplectic map from x to itself. So it's just symplectic from the fibers to the fibers. Um, and the way you should think of this, uh, this flow is that this is kind of like uh, similar to a Moser trick because uh, the fibers say will all be symplectically isomorphic because of course you can reverse this map. And so you get symplectomorphisms of whatever this symplectic manifold is with uh, another copy of itself um, constructed from a vector field. So really the gradient Hamiltonian vector field is kind of like uh, similar in many ways to a Moser trick. And we saw this, uh, sorry. Can you still hear me, me? Hopefully the sound is better now. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry. I wasn't plugged in on my, on my headphones. Yeah, so, so, uh, so yeah, so this is a very nice vector field. There's something to mention that's a, a subtlety here, which is that, of course, you have a vector field and uh, you're looking at its flow, and maybe um, this flow blows up in some finite time. Right. And so, if you're interested in constructing a symplectomorphism from one fiber to another, you need to check with some theory somehow that this flow is actually defined up to time t. Otherwise, uh, this does not make sense. So there's something subtle there if, uh, if you're in a, a sort of a general situation. OK, so, so here's the example, which is totally unrelated to what I want to tell you. But I think if you want to understand um, torque degenerations, this is the, the example everyone should try to, to uh, learn. Um, so let's take the two by two complex matrices and uh, consider the determinant map. Uh, so this is a map to the complex plane. And the fiber over one is the uh, group of special linear two by two matrices. The fiber over zero is the singular matrices. Uh, and this total space is equipped with a nice Kähler structure. So here's a formula for the symplectic form. So, I mean, it's a kind of an exercise uh, maybe, and I'll show you below what the result should be in some special cases, but you can compute, of course, the gradient Hamiltonian vector field of the determinant map with respect to this symplectic structure. And it has the nice property that it's invariant with respect to multiplication on the left by SU2 and multiplication on the right by SU2. So this is a, a property of the gradient Hamiltonian vector field. Now, uh, we want to integrate this map, um, but of course it's a differential equation. So generally we should avoid by hand integrating differential equations, especially on something uh, with this larger dimension. So we can cut down the dimension using this symmetry by observing that every X, which is in a fiber not zero, uh, will have a Carton decomposition. So we can write X as GA, G prime, where uh, G and G prime are Make, uh, elements of SU2. And A is a matrix like Anton wrote with uh, positive entries on the diagonal. So here's the exercise that you can really do uh, yourself is to show that this uh, gradient Hamiltonian vector field on this locus of uh, diagonal matrices like this has this form. And then if you just focus on what the flow looks like for matrices of this form, you can draw a picture that looks something like this. So the, the, the red line here, this is uh, the intersection of SL2C with, um, with the set of matrices with positive entries, right? Because uh, the, deter the determinant needs to be one. And so the identity matrix uh, under this flow goes towards zero as T goes towards one. Um, but if you're to the left of this, the flow goes towards uh, a point on the A2 axis like this with A1 coordinate being zero. And if you're to the right of this point, the flow goes towards a point on the A1 axis with the A2 coordinate being zero. And so in terms of our picture, 
it looks roughly like this. So there's this subspace of SL2C. And for one point in this subspace, the flow as you approach uh, one uh, goes towards this singular point of the fiber. And then for other points on this red locus, uh, it goes towards some non-singular points on the fiber. And I think this is all, all of this is exercises. Uh, I think, you know, if, if you really wanna understand torque degenerations, I would say just to really understand this example well, that's uh, the best first thing to start with. Um, and this is explained in a more detail in this paper of Hilgert, Martins and Mannon from 2017. They, they have this nice picture in their paper. So I'm kind of stealing the picture from them. So what happens in this case is that the singular fiber of this map is torque because it's given by this binomial, um, which is the determinant being equal to zero, right? And so, right, what is a torque variety? It's just something cut out by a binomial ideal. So this is a torque variety. And the, the fiber over one, which we saw was SL2C, as a symplectic manifold, maybe a better way to represent it is that it's the cotangent bundle of the three sphere. Well, S3 is just SU2. And uh, to, to maybe study what this gradient Hamiltonian flow map is doing in more detail, if you're at a point which is in the SU2 orbit of your one fiber of that identity, which is of course the zero section of this cotangent bundle, then the flow is gonna collapse you to the singular point of the torque variety. And then at all the other points, it's going to send you somewhere to the smooth locus of this torque variety. And so actually what happens is that away from this zero section, this map defines a symplectomorphism from the complement of the zero section, the cotangent bundle of S3 onto the smooth locus of this torque variety. And it extends continuously because everything in the zero section uh, gets sent to this singular point and it, it, that fits continuously with the map I just described. Well, you can see it from the picture on the previous page. In any event, uh, if you take this map to be the continuous extension of the flow across the zero, uh, uh, zero section of this cotangent bundle, then you see that when you compose this with the moment map for the torus action on this torque variety, you get what looks like an integrable system on the cotangent bundle of S3. Except, uh, well, there's two torus, uh, there's two S1 actions on, on T star S3 that are coming from two circle actions on this torque variety and they extend smoothly across the whole thing. But then there's this extra S1 symmetry coming from the torque variety, uh, which doesn't extend nicely across the zero section. And that's the, the moment map for the normalized geodesic flow on the cotangent bundle. So if you write uh, the cotangent bundle of S3 uh, in this representation here, which is what people are maybe more familiar with if they talk about integrable systems on cotangent bundles, then that extra Hamiltonian that you get by composing the flow with this torque moment map is exactly the norm, not norm squared of the momentum, right? And so if you know some classical mechanics, this is generating this S1 action on the complement of the zero section called the normalized geodesic flow. And this is a comment that was made by Alan Knudsen on math overflow many years ago. And I think it inspired a lot of the things that were done subsequently about torque degeneration. Um, so I think also, if you know a little bit of integrable systems and symplectic geometry, making sense of the details here is also sort of a fundamental exercise. So are there any questions about torque degenerations? and integrable systems constructed from torque degenerations. So, so the idea here, I guess, that I'm trying to say is that this is an example, uh, this degeneration that we just saw, right? This is an example of a torque degeneration because the generic fiber is some variety and the, the fiber over zero is some torque variety. And you can use the gradient Hamiltonian flow as long as it extends continuously across the singular locus of the torque variety to pull back the torque moment map to a moment map on the smooth variety, which is the fiber over one. And that defines you some integrable system with possibly some singular locus. And this is, this is how you construct a, 
an integrable system by torque degeneration. So I think this example has really all the definitions in it implicitly. Of course, there's some subtleties, right? In general, you need to sh prove something about uh, the flow extending continuously across uh, the singular locus. Um, and the other thing that's not at all true in general is that here we have this extremely nice symmetry. And then when we reduce by this symmetry, we get a vector field that happens to be exactly solvable. And that's how we wrote down these nice solutions here. But in general, this is not at all going to be the case because, of course, ordinary differential equations are terrible um, and uh, one should try to avoid writing down solutions to them as much as possible. At least that's my experience. Um, because there'll be some messy and nasty things. So, so in this case, things look uh, much nicer than they do in the general case. All right, so there's some previous results that I should mention briefly, but I don't have time to really get into them in detail. Um, one is that Nishinu Nohari Ueda in 2010 showed that if you look at an integral co-joint orbit uh, of the unitary group, uh, then you can recover the gelfand zetland system on the nose by such a construction. So there's a very particular torque degeneration of that co-joint orbit, and uh, you can, Bed everything so that there's a Kähler structure, and then the composition of this time one continuously extended gradient Hamiltonian flow map with the moment map on the associated torque variety uh, commutes in a diagram like this. Hey, Mikola, can you turn off your, your microphone? Anyways. Um, so, so then uh, somewhat later, Harada and Kave showed a, a more general result, which is that if you have a compact connected Lie group and you take a, a dominant integral weight of, uh, of that group, then you can do a similar construction to get a, an integrable system on uh, the corresponding integral co-joint orbit. So of course, there's no uh, diagonal map here. Um, because uh, this is this is the construction, right? We don't know uh, some explicit um, uh, sort of coordinate uh, representation of what this composition looks like because this is the solution to some nasty ODE, right? So what's actually really nice about this Nishinu Nohara Ueda is that um, they solve this ODE and they do this composition. They show that it recovers this gelfand zetland system, which we've written down very explicitly using those eigenvalues. In this case, there's no such thing. Yeah, and Harada and Kaveh's result actually is something more general than what I drew here. In fact, um, they show that is, is, as long as you have some smooth projective variety with a Kähler structure that's coming from the embedding into projective space um, and some additional data that satisfies some nice conditions, then you can do this sort of construction. And uh, in this work, the projective and smooth aspect of the variety are very important. But that's just some context. So let's try to continue. All right, so now we want to do something. Uh, well, just going back to what Anton said the goal was, we want to construct action angle coordinates on G star with the KKS plus on structure where uh, G is some compact connected Lie group. And in what follows, it's gonna be simple for me, it's gonna simplify things for me to say that G is semi-simple, but in fact, everything that I'm gonna say can be generalized to the uh, reductive case. And um, T is gonna be our maximal torus of G. So the starting point for the way that we're gonna solve this problem uh, from the perspective of Benjamin and I is that we're gonna first look at this very classical object known as base affine space. So in order to do this, and I'm gonna show an example on the next slide that should hopefully make everything more clear here, but in order to do this, we need to start by taking a maximal unipotent subgroup N compatible with the maximal torus. And this is inside the complexification of the Lie group G. And uh, first recall that uh, the the ring of functions on the complexification is a G times G algebra, where uh, this comes from the action of G on itself on the left and the right. 
And with respect to this G times G action, it has a decomposition into uh, uh, a direct sum of modules where the G on the left acts via this representation and the G on the right acts via this representation. And this is just an algebraic version of the Peter file theorem. Now uh, we have this uh, maximal unipotent subgroup N here. And what we want to do is to take a quotient with respect to this N. Um, and we'll see why in a second. But uh, yeah, in terms of the coordinate ring, we do it like this. So we take N inside the right copy. And uh, as you know, when you have a highest weight representation and you quotient by the, the maximal unipotent, all that's left is the highest weight itself. And so we can write the resulting quotient at least as a module like this. And that's a nice way to represent this, uh, this quotient coordinate ring. Um, and it'll have a residual action of G times the torus, uh, G coming from the left, because of course it commutes. And T also, in fact, uh, will be acting on this, this uh, ring of invariance. Now, uh, something that is very useful here is that if you take uh, the set of fundamental weights, which I'm going to call capital pi, and you look at this subspace of um, the ring of invariance, which I'm going to call E star, which is just taking the direct sum of all the irreducible representations corresponding to those fundamental weights, then this, uh, this subspace actually generates this ring. And what that tells us is that um, the, the spec of this ring embeds very nicely into the dual space. And uh, also this embedding is going to be G times T invariant or equivariant, I should say, um, because of how things have embedded. And so it's this space that we've embedded here, which is the base affine space. Now, um, this is not in general a smooth variety. So uh, what you should think of is more like what's in this picture over here. So we can just take the, the ordinary quotient of G mod N and that'll embed as a dense sub variety of uh, the base affine space. And this embedding here really is as like the closure in E of this quotient G mod N. So, so the base affine space is really the affine closure of G mod N. Something else that's really useful to notice here is that from the Iwasawa decomposition, we see that G mod N, and this is why we take a quotient by N, G mod N is nothing but the compact group G times the interior of the positive vial chamber. And this was this very important uh, symplectic space that Anton was mentioning uh, in his lectures a few days ago. Uh, so this has this symplectic structure that looks like D uh, lambda paired with, uh, sorry, it's very slow, the Mara Carton form. Like this. So this at least has a canonical symplectic structure on it. And in fact, what you can do in this embedding here is you can equip E with a G times T invariant linear Kähler structure so that the highest weight vectors all have norm equal to one. And uh, when you do this, uh, if you rig up the embedding uh, in the right way, then in fact, uh, the pullback of that uh, Kähler structure on E to this uh, submanifold is exactly the canonical symplectic form that, that uh, that Anton was talking about before. Um, so in particular, uh, something to notice, right, is that when you take a quotient by T on the left here, you just get the, uh, the regular part of the dual of the Lie algebra, where here I don't mean the notation of Anton, I mean really the, uni uh, the, the union of all the regular co-adjoint orbits. And over on the right, what you get is all of the Lie algebra dual G star. So I promised an example to make this hopefully more clear. So let's, let's do an example. So if you take G to be SU3, uh, then the positive vial chamber looks like this and you have two fundamental weights. Uh, there's four faces to the positive vial chamber as a polyhedral cone. And so uh, to build first the vector space E, 
we should recall that the two fundamental representations of SU3 are um, the standard representation and wedge two of the standard representation. And then another thing to notice, um, because you can write out uh, pretty explicitly what the, the action of this unipotent subgroup on SL3 will look like, uh, a nice representation of the coordinate ring uh, of invariance like this. So it's the coordinate ring generated by delta i and delta ij, where delta i are these one by one minors in the three by three matrix, and delta ij are these one by uh, two by two minors that I've drawn here in, in the three by three matrix. And again, it's an exercise you can check that they satisfy this nice relation. So uh, this variety is generated by these minors uh, mod this ideal uh, generated by this one uh, this one polynomial. Something interesting to notice here, right, is that uh, this is not a toric ideal, right? It's not a binomial ideal. But uh, maybe at the same time, if you think about it, it's very close to being a toric ideal. Right. So corresponding to each of these faces of the positive vial chamber, you have a parabolic. And when you take the commutator of that parabolic, you get um, a nice uh, subgroup of SL3. So the, the maximal face here corresponds to a Borel whose commutator is the maximal unipotent. These two other faces correspond to parabolics whose commutators look like this and like this. And in fact, when you embed SL3 mod n, the base affine space into the vector space E, which is just the direct sum of these two vector spaces, you get that it decomposes. Uh, well, in general, it, it decomposes like this, but you get that it decomposes as the union, disjoint union of the following spaces. So you have the SLN mod n, which is dense. And then you have these lower dimensional pieces, which are SL3 mod the commutator of the corresponding parabolics. Um, so you get these three other spaces. And actually, the way that these lower dimensional spaces live inside E is roughly like this. So uh, E also decomposes, and the decomposition of E plays very nicely with the decomposition of these subspaces. And really, the way to see this uh, very explicitly is that um, how, how exactly does this embedding work here? Well, you take inside E, you take uh, the direct, uh, you take the sum of these two fundamental weights. And you look at the action of SL3 on E, and the orbit through this point will be exactly SL3 mod N, and the closure will be the base affine space. So in particular, this is the orbit of SL3 through just the V1. You can do this all very explicitly. Okay, so, so, so is, is this clear or am I saying some, some nonsense? That's good. Okay, good. So, uh, right. So, well, now we understand some examples. So I can go back to saying some some general some general nonsense. We have this base affine space, and we want to make a toric variety out of it. And I'm going to give you one example of a way that you can do this. But actually, uh, what I'm describing is uh, just a special case of sort of uh, much more general construction. So you may recall that if you take a, a specialization at Q equals one of Lustig's uh, dual canonical basis, which is uh, uh, something for the quantum group, then you get a basis, uh, which I'm gonna write as a decomposition into one dimensional subspaces for the coordinate ring of base affine space, which looks like this. So here B is some set, which is a disjoint union over elements uh, dominant weights lambda of some B lambda. And then each B lambda is a canonical basis for, for the irreducible representation B lambda star. Uh, now, um, what one can do is uh, 
take, for example, a string parameterization of the dual canonical basis B, which identifies B bijectively with a set of lattice points in this vector space, where R is the rank of G and M is the length of the longest element of the file group. And in fact, uh, this set of lattice points will be the semigroup of lattice points that span a, a cone. So uh, the semigroup is finitely generated and the cone is a nice, a nice cone. And when you put, uh, when you put say like a lexicographical order on this lattice, what happens, and this is really a magical thing about canonical bases, is that with respect to that order, when you multiply two elements from two of these vector spaces, which I'm going to call like B lambda and B lambda prime prime, you get essentially addition with respect to the semigroup, plus some other terms that might be lower in the order. So uh, this would look something like the following. Like if you have this element here, uh, maybe I shouldn't try to write this. No, the, the, sorry, the tablet is not going to work. Okay, but 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 there's this there's this relation here which says that roughly multiplication in the coordinate ring of base affine space is the semigroup multiplication, but you get some lower terms. And this is also sort of similar to something Anton was doing as well, uh, right? Which is that you get some kind of uh, 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 log canonical plus something that's lower in some order. But this is just a simple algebraic geometry version of that. So when you have such a, a property of your coordinate ring, this gives you a, a, a multi-graded filtration of your coordinate ring with respect to, uh, to this map. Um, and uh, we can turn this into a Z-graded filtration uh, with by picking some linear map, which uh, sort of cuts out the points in this lattice in a nice way. So these are the fibers illustrated in red here of some linear map. And this will convert this from a Z to the M plus R multi-graded filtration into a Z-graded filtration. Yeah, and if you have a Z-graded filtration of an algebra, then it's uh, an exercise that roughly uh, you should know the following things. So um, you can take the, the Reese algebra of this filtration, which is the algebra, um, which looks like this. And it's a subalgebra of the tensor product of whatever your space was that you've graded um, or filtered rather along with uh, the coordinate ring of, of the complex plane. And so uh, this space embeds nicely into the product of whatever your space was times the complex plane. And there's a natural projection from this space down to the complex plane, which I'll call pi. And this Reese algebra has the property that when you look at uh, geometrically what this coordinate ring is, the zero fiber is exactly the, the toric variety corresponding to the semigroup S that comes from your cone. And uh, generic fibers are exactly the variety that you started with. So in this case, the base affine space. And so what this construction gives us coming from the dual canonical basis is a torque degeneration, which I've written down here of the base affine space. And uh, the torque variety you get as the zero fiber is something that's rather explicit in terms of the combinatorics of, of uh, the string parameterization and the dual canonical basis. Um, and I should say here that uh, this version of the story really is due to Felipe Caldero. Uh, and there is also a paper of Alexiev, but not the one in this mini course, um, and Brignol, which was related to that as well. And I'll try to mention later in the talk that there's some more general version of this, um, this story. Uh, but this, this is the nice way to understand it, I think, for a first pass. Right, and so, so this toric variety is acted on by a complex torus, and I'm going to call it TC. So T will just be the, the compact subtorus, um, and it looks like this. OK, so we made some torque degenerations of our base affine space. And now here comes the magic of the gradient Hamiltonian vector field. Let me just try to zoom out here. Yep. 
Yeah. So it turns out, and, and there's some work involved in this slide that I'm, I'm sweeping under the rug. Well, you can embed this torque degeneration of the base affine space into the product of this vector space E uh, times the complex plane so that uh, the, the projection map of the torque degeneration commutes in this diagram with just projection to the complex plane. And this embedding I should mention is T times T uh, equivariant. The other thing uh, that we should recall is that there's a Kähler structure on E times C because we fixed a Kähler structure on E and then C has just whatever the standard Kähler structure. Now, um, it's really important to arrange this embedding so that the action of the torus on the zero fiber, this torque action, actually extends linearly to an action on the zero fiber of this projection map so that the Kähler structure on the ambient space is invariant with respect to this torque action. Because this tells you that you'll have a moment map for your torque action. Otherwise, you don't have a moment map. And um, here, in general, there's something to be said about arranging that this can be so. And we found that the theory of valuations made the most sense for describing this um, because roughly valuations are what allow you to do some sort of Gram-Schmidt um, to find an orthogonal basis. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's all I wanna say about valuations, but really in our work, valuations play quite a central role. So in particular, something that I, I should mention here is that the string parameterizations of the dual canonical basis which I believe are due to Berenstein Zelovinsky. They have valuation counterparts, uh, which I believe are due to Kumar's cave, um, which are known as string valuations. So you can sort of make sense of the, the uh, string parameterization in terms of valuations. And this allows us to do this arrangement with the Kähler structure. Right, um, now, uh, the next thing we want to do is take your torque degeneration, uh, put the gradient Hamiltonian vector field on this, this variety, which now has a Kähler structure from this embedding and do the time one flow, uh, which will take you from the uh, base affine space to this torque variety X zero. But it's a little tricky because the base affine space is not smooth. And so really this variety here, even away from zero is not smooth. Rather, what we can do is we can say that uh, maybe I already wrote it here, so I shouldn't try to write it again. Away from zero, this variety decomposes into a union of smooth varieties, which are indexed by the faces of the positive vial chamber. And so each of these is a degeneration, a torque degeneration of the corresponding smooth piece of the base affine space, which uh, looks similar to what I showed you for SU3. And so on each of these smooth pieces of this torque degeneration, you can define a gradient Hamiltonian vector field. And then you can just say, well, piecewise, this is our gradient Hamiltonian vector field on all of, all of X or all of X minus the zero fiber at least. But this is a bit of a problem because there's no guarantee that you can actually integrate this flow on these non-compact uh, spaces. Um, and also there's no guarantee that between the different pieces of this space, which we've just stratified, that the flows uh, fit together in a continuous manner. But actually uh, it turns out that, that we were able to show that all of this is true, so it all works. And the result is, um, well, yeah, maybe I should also say, a very, very important and useful fact here is that this gradient Hamiltonian vector field is T times T invariant. So if you recall back to the example at the very beginning, we use this like SU3 times SU3 uh, invariance property of the gradient Hamiltonian vector field in that example to integrate the flow uh, very explicitly by kind of reducing to this, this uh, sub variety that was red. Now, um, this symmetry here is not big enough for us to be able to do something like that to, to really solve explicitly. Uh, 
But this symmetry does allow us to prove that it's possible to integrate this flow and that it's continuous. So we have some abstract theorems um, about the flow of this vector field, about how it fits together continuously and how it extends over the singular part at the zero fiber. And in the proof, the t times t invariance of this vector field is, is of fundamental use. Right, so what we end up with is a picture that looks like this. So uh, here, the one fiber is the base affine space. The zero fiber is uh, this toric variety corresponding to this semigroup. And we have a moment map, mu t, because we arrange so that the Kähler structures fit together nicely. And the image of that moment map is exactly the cone spanned by the semigroup, which is the, the, the cone that we saw before. Now, this flow here is T invariant. And this map here is also, sorry, this flow is T equivariant, I should say. And this moment map is T invariant because T is a subtorus of the big torus. And so on the right, if we quotient by this T, so this is really the copy of T that lives in the, the right part of G times T. If we quotient here, we recover uh, G star. And this composition descends to a map from G star to the cone. So from this uh, choice of string parameterization or valuation or whatever you want to call the data that we put on the base affine space, we recover an integrable system on G star whose image is exactly the cone spanned by that, uh, that semigroup. So that's kind of the, the main result. And now I, I should try to say the, the last few punchlines before I run out of time, but I think I can make it. How does this give us action angle coordinates on G star? Well, inside the, the torque variety, we have this dense action angle coordinate symplectic manifold, which is just the interior of the cone times this big torus. And inside uh, the base affine space, we had this uh, canonical space that Anton mentioned. And of course, this, this map, it turns out, is a symplectomorphism on a dense subset. And you can use that to embed backwards by inverting that symplectomorphism, this space into this canonical space here. And now you can quotient by the torus on both sides. And on the right, you get the set of regular elements in the dual uh, of the Lie algebra G. And on the left, you get the interior of the cone times a torus of dimension M. Both of these things project down to the interior of the vial chamber, where if you take an element of the interior of the vial chamber, on the right, the pre-image is a co-adjoint orbit. And on the left, you get the product of the interior of a polytope, which is just a fiber of a linear projection in this interior of a cone, times this S1 to the M. And this composition is an embedding of this space into this space. This is just how the maps fit together. So for example, if we did a string parameterization, then this gives us a string polytope. But if you take some different valuations, you can actually get many different polytopes and cones. And this is something that's worth mentioning. Um, but so this embedding now gives you uh, action angle coordinates on a dense subset of this orbit. And something that's very important to mention here um, in comparison to the results of Harada and Cave, is that lambda need not be integral. I, I, yeah, so I don't want to write it out because my, my computer will be too slow, but, but lambda need not be integral here, so this is a uh, much more general than, than the earlier result. Right, and then I have one minute left, so I should say one more thing. And this is actually also very interesting, just from the perspective of classical mechanics, um, but also maybe in some connection to representation theory as well. So if you have a Hamiltonian G space, which is just some symplectic manifold with a moment map and a G action, then you can take this map on G star and you can compose it with the map F that I, that I wrote down before. And this will give you some image, which is a subset of whatever the cone was that you had. And it's a theorem we prove that if this Hamiltonian G space is multiplicity free, 
which is uh, the Hamiltonian analog of being a multiplicity free representation, then this composition defines action angle coordinates on a dense subset of this symplectic manifold. Now, there's two things that I want to say about this. One is that composing a moment map with uh, an integrable system on G star, even if this integrable system has action angle coordinates on G star, it does not guarantee that this composition will have action angle coordinates on M. And this is due to something which Gilliman and Sternberg called mutation effects. So a, a Hamiltonian on G star, which generates a circle action on G star, when you pull it back, it might not generate a circle action on M. But it's part of the theorem that we prove. And this is exactly why we construct an integrable system on this space, um, because that's how we prove it, that this will have action angle coordinates. And so one example, all this, although this is sort of trivial, is, is kind of like this, this thing that we saw from the previous um, slide. But, but the point is that uh, now M can really be something arbitrary. So that's, uh, that's, that's all I wanted to say. I'm, I'm really sorry I had to go, I think, a little bit fast, but I'm also going to have to run away in, in two or three minutes as well. So maybe we should go to questions. Yeah, maybe I should also say, like, just to inspire the questions. Um, I think it sounds like there's so many similarities between this and between the story that Anton's telling in the mini course. Um, and I was involved in both projects, uh, but I totally can't see how to relate them. Um, and I think maybe it would be uh, very interesting to to make some sense of how how they might be related. But uh, I don't think I'm the person to do it. Any questions? Um, so if not, then uh, thank you very much, Jeremy, for a really very interesting talk. Uh, okay, so. All right, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. Okay, so uh, okay, so uh, Leonid, do you want to break or should, should uh, we continue? So, uh, so maybe, maybe you can just just start. Sure, whatever, whatever you you say, right? Okay, so um, again, thanks a lot, Jeremy, for a very nice talk. Uh, so um, we, we, we're going to finish this uh, mini course with uh, uh, some uh, results and open problems um, in the other approach. But in fact, um, uh, so I uh, I had a glance into uh, Jeremy's slides before, and I thought maybe one interesting point is to discuss those cones, right? Up to now, everybody is telling you you're getting a cone times a torus, but what is that cone? So we'll spend some time uh, by looking at those cones. So let me recall um, uh, a theorem that we stated last time. So, um, so there was a, a Poisson structure on the dual Poisson group. Uh, and um, so we were, we were taking a scaling of it uh, and we were using cluster slash tropical. So some kind of rescaled uh, cluster coordinates. And those coordinates were called zeta and phi, and they depend on S. 
And the claim was that when S goes to infinity, uh, this Poisson bracket, it has a limit, which is called pi infinity. And this limit is actually some kind of constant Poisson bracket. Um, but then it only works if, uh, mm, if those zeta coordinates are contained in the interior of some polyhedral cone. So now um, let me formulate a number of questions that we're going to address. Uh, so maybe the first question is, what is C? So that's the same C as the one that uh, Jeremy was using uh, in, uh, in his talk today. Uh, and he gave some kind of definition, but maybe uh, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. Now the next question is, what happens outside C? And then, um, so Jeremy showed to you dense Darbu charts. Uh, in this approach, you can get large. Darbu charts. Now uh, we'll see whether we'll spend time on it since Jeremy already shown you some nice charts. And then maybe the last question is about tropical Kingsburg Feinstein and what uh, uh, and possibly tropical. Poisson Lee theory. Right. Okay. So we, we're going to answer some of these questions, but most of those questions they will remain open. And I think that's that's probably okay for the last part of the talk. So um, right. Uh, so the description of the cone, and uh, it goes with the following notion of the Berenstein cash down potential. Uh, so let me define G star plus and Mm, this will be elements of um, G star, where, first of all, let's say they're in this zeta phi chart, and we want to put all the angles equal to zero. So this is um, a sort of totally positive, totally positive part. Uh, in the spirit of um, Femin Zelivinsky, total positivity theory. And this uh, um, Berenstein Kashdan potential will be a function from this G star plus to uh, positive reals. Uh, and um, I will describe it in examples. I think that's, that's kind of easier than to give you a general definition. So I will tell, tell you what it is for SU2 and for U3. And from that, it will be more or less clear that you can do it for arbitrary compact, uh, compact group. So um, let's say G is SU2. In this case, um, an element of G star is something like this. And phi of A will be equal to A plus A minus one over B. So you see, this is a concrete rational function um, on, uh, on G star. So perhaps 
it is instructive to uh, to also look at it for uh, for u3 because u3 sorry sorry anton phi is defined on g star plus so you've extended it or are you uh, to let's say suppose that a is an element of um, um g of star g plus, star plus mm -hmm. which would mean that uh, a and b are anyways positive reals so let me assume that b is a positive is a positive real. Mm -hmm. uh, I can also extend it, but it, it makes a bit less sense. But uh, let, let's let's assume that I, I I restrict myself to G star plus. That's a little bit a matter of taste. Um, uh, so in the U3 case, I will write it in terms of minus. Remember, we, we had those minor coordinates. Uh, so here will be something like this um, plus delta one two two three delta one three two three plus delta one two one three and perhaps it's instructive uh, to draw those minus uh, so let's say this is my upper triangular three by three matrix. And then uh, let's say this two by two minor in the denominator, that's this guy. And then uh, the, the, the minus in the numerator. So they're made out of uh, this and uh, one more column and out of this. So you're basically moving either one row or one column. And it turns out that in the general case for general type, there is, there is a way to make sense of it. So there are those rational functions and note that those uh, rational subtraction Three functions. Uh, and the important part here is that it is subtraction free. You will see, you will see why. Okay. So now um, recall that those deltas, they are monomials. So deltas are monomials in uh, monomials in factorization parameters. And the factorization parameters under our change of variables, they were equal, at least if phi are equal to zero to some exponentials of T zetas. So, um, so in general, we have phi, which is uh, equal to, to a sum with some coefficients, let's say phi k. And here we get exponentials of t of some uh, linear functions of zetas, right? So this is, this is a form. So now um, um, there is this notion of tropicalization. So I will now write a tropical function of zetas. And that's, well, um, you will see it's a prescription, but you can also think that we are passing to the tropical semi-ring. Uh, so this is a, a max of uh, those LK of zeta for all Ks in the sum. So on the right hand side, there is a finite number of terms. Uh, and uh, so we are taking a max over, uh, over those linear functions. So this is a piecewise linear, piecewise linear function. Um, now the cone C, 
are those zetas in uh, r to the power n such that this tropical function is non-positive. Uh, there are different conventions. I think most people like minima and non-negative functions. I, I write it with maxima and non-positive function. So that's, that's this uh, uh, so-called Bernstein, uh, Bernstein Kajdan cone. Uh, and you see uh, there, there is one function which uh, defines it. Of course, this function, perhaps it has many terms. For instance, if we look at the SU2 example, right there, it was a very, um, very easy function. And um, uh, this tropical, in this case, this tropical Bernstein Kajdan potential. Um, have a look, right? We, we, we need to take uh, we need to take this expression, and we need to tropicalize it. Uh, so, what would it give? So, this would give us a max of uh, zeta a minus zeta b and minus zeta a minus zeta b, right? Well, in this case. The cone C is easy to describe, right? So these are zeta A, zeta B in R2, such that zeta A minus zeta B is smaller than zero and minus zeta A minus zeta B smaller than zero. And uh, it's a very easy exercise to, um, to show that this is the same has the following set of inequalities, which will, I guess, uh, oops. For some reason, I don't see anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. sorry, right. sorry, sorry, yeah, uh, just a second. Um, oh, that's because, sorry, my tablet got disconnected. It usually doesn't happen, but let me see what the problem is. Oh, oof. Okay. Um, just a second. Let's hope. Let's hope we can make it work again. Um, yeah, that's because the. Yeah, I'm sorry, but well, good that it happens only uh, um, at the last minutes of the mini course. Hmm. It's bad it, it happens. Uh, oof, uh, hmm. uh, yeah, sorry people, I, 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 I might have to continue I might have to continue writing uh, instead of the pad just on the, uh, um, with the mouse. It's gonna be a little bit painful, but um, uh, okay. So let's, uh, hmm. let's try. Probably the tablet is telling us that, well, the mini course is close to its end and well, it should end soon. Okay, so do you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, I do. I, I. It's also maybe you can connect your pad to your computer and use it like that. As I don't. I don't have a good cable. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it would be good, but uh, hmm. no, just just the last attempt because that. Uh, I think I use a much lower tech solution, but uh, it's. Yeah. Well, I mean. Yeah. Ironic. So, Never mind. Yeah, you're probably yeah. That's that's probably good what you're doing. Okay, it's not even uh, electronic. Yeah. Okay. So let me reproduce what what, what we had. Right. So we had that phi of a, uh, which was equal to a plus a minus one over b, right? And uh, we had that uh, phi drop, 
which was equal to um, to an L uh, to a point in R two, uh, which would satisfy a pair of inequalities zeta a minus zeta b small equal to zero and uh, minus zeta a minus zeta b also small equal to zero. And I was about to say that uh, this is equivalent to uh, the following uh, inequalities, which I'm writing in, uh, in the form which should look familiar, right? And if I put them in the triangular pattern, this is exactly a GZ or interlacing inequalities, right? In fact, um, the uh, um, uh, a simple claim is as follows. Um, so if you take, uh, remember at some point we decided that for parametrization, we should choose uh, a long word. And if I choose the long word, um, in uh, for un like this, or for sun, then it turns out that c is exactly the Gelfin site in column. But if you choose some other parameterization, there would be uh, those uh, generalized string columns. There, there, will, there will be different different things, right? Um, Okay, so that was the description of the cone. Now, um, actually, how is it related to the story of uh, Poisson brackets? Let me uh, let me recall that uh, right. We, we were saying that the Poisson brackets of uh, those minus they were of the following form. Let me write it like this. So delta delta bar prime. And here there would be some kind of constant possibly, right? So this is a constant. So this is a log canonical term, but plus um, there is a lot of other stuff. In our slang, we call it garbage, but well, uh, of course, these are, uh, these are the terms of the, uh, of the same type as we saw before, right? So here there will be some coefficients here there will be um, some linear functions of zeta. And now we don't write it on G star plus, uh, a priori there will be also some, some kind of angles. Right? So in general, there will be something like this. And these are M and L are again linear functions. So that's, uh, that's how, how it looks like, right? Now the claim is uh, if phi tropical of zeta is small or equal to zero, which means we are, uh, uh, we, we are in the cone of uh, Bernstein and Kashdan, then all those linear functions LK of zeta, they are also uh, small or equal to zero. And actually, that's why uh, when S goes to infinity, uh, all those terms, uh, they die. Um, in fact, you see, this is, um, this is very, very interesting. Uh, so there is that one function, which kind of uh, uh, tells you about all the possible brackets, right? There are many brackets, delta, delta prime. Each bracket has many, many terms. I was thinking a little bit to show you how it all looks like even for U3. It's uh, kind of scary. And then I decided against it. Um, so um, so we, uh, we use the following terminology here. We are saying that phi, dominates the bracket. So which means that uh, the bracket uh, on, on G star is uh, more or less log canonical, uh, modular the terms which would die if phi dies. 
Um, here there is an open research question. So uh, there is some deep relation between phi and pi, but this relation is a kind of strange relation, right? We need to send, uh, we, we need to introduce those um, uh, uh, cluster tropical parameterizations, and then we need to send some parameters to infinity. Uh, of course, it would have been um, a lot easier um, if there was some more algebraic uh, relation between um, the function and the bracket, right? So we have a function and we have a bracket. Uh, and we, we want to link them in some way. If, the, if, if, if there were some formula which relates them, uh, I, I don't know of any reasonable formula, I must say. So you see that there is cl clearly there is something between them, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, of course you can make a definition. That's what we have done that uh, um, a potential, a, fu a function, which is uh, rational is subtraction free, it dominates the bracket. If it has roughly that property, then of course, phi is an example, but, uh, but I think it, yeah, there, there is something, there must be something which is better formulated. And uh, you see, it's, it's not, uh, it's a conceptually new element. You have a bracket and you have a function, but um, it doesn't look, Overly complicated, but uh, the I think the answer is uh, is not known. Um, all right, so um, um, may I go to the next page because then you you probably won't see this uh, this page. We can of course return later. Okay, so uh, let me finish this uh, talking about. Tropical Poisson Lee and Tropical uh, Gelfenstein, uh, Ginsburg Weinstein. Sorry. Uh, so, right. So we know that G um, star together with. The scaled bracket is a Poisson Lee group, right? So, um, in particular, this means that the product map is Poisson. So, we also know that. Uh, C times C times the Thanosaurus. This bracket bracket has pi in G star. It converges to just pi infinity. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, well, it was yeah. something with the sound. Uh, oh. Oh. It, oh. It, it, Oh, now uh, even the sound is bad. Oh, I'm I'm really sorry. Yeah, okay. I I, I don't I don't think I can do much. Right, this may, maybe my connection. No, it's okay. No, I became okay. okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, then I repeat. I briefly repeat what. Uh, so that's another hint, right? We should not continue for much longer. So, uh, so so I was just saying that. G star together with the Poisson bracket, pi G star, and maybe the scaled one is a Poisson Lee group. So the product map is Poisson. Uh, and over C, uh, over the cone times the torus, this bracket converges to pi infinity. So here is a question. Can I think of uh, uh, C times T? together with pi infinity is a sort of tropical Poisson Lee group. 
In fact, um, probably there is something like that uh, in the following sense. Um, so um, you can build maps from C times T, comma pi infinity to uh, C times T, comma pi infinity. Which we, which will be piecewise linear on the on the column side, and piecewise continuous or piecewise uh, uh, yeah piecewise continuous on the on the torus side. So and. Uh, on each uh, on each chamber where it makes sense where the uh, so it, it would it would be the map now will be only uh, densely defined but wherever it is defined it is poisson um, it's not entirely clear whether this is um, whether this is a good definition maybe it is Maybe okay. Just just as a speculation, uh, in the talk of uh, Jeremy, we had this uh, uh, we had this guy right, which was um, conceptually uh, perhaps a better space which contains c times t, or maybe maybe you you, you divide also by by t right. Perhaps that was uh, that was a better. Better gadget we, we, that we don't quite know. It is relatively easy to see uh, this product map, and um, in the Poisson Lee theory, remember we also have uh, an action of G on G star, so that we saw uh, yesterday. Uh, we absolutely don't know um, what is the tropical tropical counterpart. So there is a, there is a more or less reasonable tropical um, tropical product map. You don't uh, even know the tropical counterpart of the G part. You don't even know the yeah right exactly. That's yeah that's the question. What would be you see G is uh, to start with is compact. Maybe you need to change or reject it in some way. Of course, uh, a, a priori compact gadget. Um, it's not so clear whether it admits some reasonable tropicalization. Um, one should say that uh, also Bernstein and Kishdan, they have some theory which is called geometric crystals, which look very suggestive. But uh, for now, it was not clear how, I mean, various attempts they, uh, they didn't, uh, did, didn't bring uh, a satisfactory answer. To how how to relate it to this story? So geometric crystals, in principle, that's probably it. it I mean, when and if one finds the good answer, then it, it's relatively clear that geometric crystals will play a role. But um, so maybe I should say it. So geometric crystals, right? And uh, here, I think, will be my last slide. So tropical Ginsburg-Weinstein. And um, here is a conjecture. So there is a um, Ginsburg-Weinstein map. So uh, a Poisson isomorphism between small G star um, and capital G star, such that, uh, and now we make a composition of the tropical cluster chart and of gamma and of uh, the scaling map. So that's what we called gamma S. And uh, this would be a map from some dense subset. Let me call it G star good. We, we don't quite know what it is, or in some cases we do know. So it, it, this G star good is mapped to capital G star 
and then it's mapped to uh, to the cone times the torus, right? Um, so we want this map to have an S to infinity limit, gamma infinity, and we want this map to be Poisson. So if this were true, uh, they, this would this would give us uh, again um, action angle variables on this G star good, and that would be very good for us because here by infinity recall this is just a constant Poisson bracket, so this is very good. Now uh, what do we know about it? So there is a theorem that I proved this. Uh, um, Jeremy and Yang Peng Li. And it says that uh, in, the, in the simple case, when G is equal to UN, uh, so, um, so, so th 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 there is such a gamma, and this is a gamma which, is, which was constructed by Mein Rankin and myself. And then uh, um, uh, we get back um, the Gelfin cycling system. So this is not very exciting, but on the other hand, it's uh, kind of reassuring that such gammas in principle, they exist. Uh, in, in the general case, it's not quite known how to find them. And um, here is an observation due to Xiaomeng Shu. I don't know whether he's gonna speak about it tomorrow, uh, so if you take uh, the stocks, the stocks uh, uh, phenomenon uh, and produce a Ginsburg-Weinstein map according to the Bolch's recipe, then uh, uh, the S to infinity limit does not exist. So there is no convergence of the corresponding gamma. And this is roughly because of the following so uh, remember, we have those uh, zeta variables and phi variables, and phi variables behave as um, s times a constant plus something. So basically, when you when you make a limit of the map, then then those uh, those variables they're spinning faster and faster, and uh, th there is no convergence. But for, for the map that Minor can and I introduced there, the, the five coordinates are tame and nothing happens to them. Uh, or I mean, they converge to some values. So um, you see there is, um, I think um, in the story, there, is, uh, there are some interesting and surprising results, but there are also many open questions you, you would say that this uh, dual Poisson the group of a compact group, uh, especially because you have a Ginsburg Weinstein theorem that it's isomorphic to a small G star, there should be nothing interesting, but it turns out that uh, there are many interesting things on the one hand, and uh, there are still many um, open questions. So I think that there you, you can have still uh, much more satisfactory answers in the future, hopefully. Perhaps the story that Jeremy told, told us today, perhaps one can also use it to better understand these questions. But um, as Jeremy mentioned right at the moment, the, the, the two stories look very similar, but the relation between them uh, is, not completely, uh, is not completely clear, uh, right? So perhaps it's a good point to stop, especially, you know, the technology is, uh, is failing us. So probably it's a sign that uh, this part of the mini course uh, should stop. And let me just remind you that uh, tomorrow, um, the talk of uh, Xiaoming Shu is, uh, is both both part, uh, part of this mini course and also a separate talk because there he will be talking about Gelfin cycling, but exactly from the perspective of the Stokes phenomenon. Well, 
Thanks, thanks for taking this for so long time. And uh, I think that's probably uh, the end point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I have, uh, I have a question uh, on uh, on this uh, limit for only group. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, uh, structure on the, on the product of the point and torus. So, uh, what can be said about this piece was linear map? So, is it a map from uh, from from the cone times cone to the cone? And uh, uh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should. I, what I can say. what does it look? The, there is a map from a cone times the cone to the cone. Right. So that's so this map. Uh, it uh, kind of what happens with the cone does not depend on the angles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what depend what happens with the angles does depend to what happens with the with the cone. And roughly speaking, so uh, this piecewise linear map, uh, its comp each component of it is a maximum of some linear functions, mm -hmm. and uh, one of those linear functions spins. Right? right, and then the angle, roughly speaking, the curves, the angle uh, goes. Uh, uh, the uh, the the angle map wants to know which one won, mm -hmm. and you get the angle of the function which won. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, when you go when you have a wall crossing, when you go on the other side of the wall, the mm -hmm. angle simply jumps because uh, there were two functions. Two linear functions and they had corresponding angles, right? So you had two pairs, uh, a, a, a zeta and a phi. So roughly speaking, I would say you, you can more or less well, let's say let's take a model a model case where you have zeta phi and zeta prime phi prime, and then the map would be something like this. This would be max of zeta and zeta prime. So this is a piecewise linear continuous map. It has a wall crossing at zeta equal to zeta prime. And here it would be phi if zeta is bigger than zeta prime and phi prime if zeta is smaller than zeta prime. And on the wall, it's simply not defined. Oh, I see. So that, 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 that's how those maps look like. And what is uh, very interesting, or I mean, magical in some way, that uh, recall that pi infinity, they are not piecewise linear. So, sorry, they are not piecewise constant. They're simply constant everywhere. And on all the chambers, the maps are Poisson maps. For, I mean, so phi jumps, uh, but. Uh, Still, you get you get you get Poisson maps on all sides of the walls. Uh -huh. So that I mean, I, I don't quite know. Of course, this cluster theory it's usually very magical, but I, I don't know whether it's a good explanation. I uh, it all works uh, very nicely. Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't quite know why. In particular, pi infinity a priori it could have been some. Uh, uh, maybe piecewise constant bracket, but but they, in all our examples, they're always simply constant. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So the category uh, that that's probably the right category. It allows for piecewise linear maps on the zeta side, and uh, you know those uh, piecewise uh, con continuous or piecewise uh, smooth maps on the phi side, but in reality. Mm -hmm. For instance, pies, they are all very good. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I should also say that uh, uh, since we go to tropicalization, there is nothing like the inversion. But that, that we do not expect. Uh, so, so this will be at best some kind of, uh, so, so now it's a partially defined semi-group law. Maybe if I were uh, if I were uh, a professional tropical geometer, perhaps we could have described uh, you know in tropical geometry objects are usually more complicated. So what, what we are doing is some kind of poor man's 
version of tropical geometry. <laughs> Uh, so you mean uh, that uh, this cone should should be some something like? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you, 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 you know, they usually right. They, they, they know that those uh, for know. Instance, tropical lines, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right? They are usually something like this. I think what what I am trying to sell you is this is this part. Uh -huh. and, uh, I'm uh, I'm not quite aware of, of, of this part, right? So, so for instance, here, uh, when uh, zeta equal to zeta prime, maybe we should say that uh, we're getting the whole component where you have all values of fives. I, I, I don't know, right? But, but then it's not going to be a map. It will be more, more like a correspondence, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, but then I don't know. One would need to develop some Poisson definitions. How? What? What does it really mean? So now, now it's a pure speculation. What? What I? What? What I, what I explained here, it really exists. So here there is no doubt. But can you can you make it more properly tropical object uh, or partially tropical object? I. I, I don't quite know. Can it not be implemented uh, explicitly, for for example, for SU2 or for SU3, like, as you did in some of your examples? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, the, the part that I, I explained, the, this uh, uh, cone times the torus with pi infinity, absolutely. You you get so, very explicit formulas. So does it, do you, you, you should be able to answer concerning what you just said about what happens on the boundary when... No, I mean, but then, but then you first need to say what you want. What, what is your structure, right? You, you, you need to come up with some definitions. Yes, if one knew what one wants, probably in those examples, it would be really easy to figure out whether it works. You're right. But I, I just don't know what's, what will be the correct, correct definition. So, that, that's 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 a, an attempt to make a definition, right? I have a set with a constant Poisson structure, possibly piecewise constant, if I can generalize, and I have a map which is uh, piecewise constant on the uh, on, uh, on 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 zetas, and which is uh, uh, piecewise whatever smooth or whatever piecewise. Uh, Linear also, but with jumps on 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 on, on the to on the torus part, and it should be Poisson map. So this this of course it should also be associative. I think that all is very easy to uh, relatively easy to prove. But I mean, is it a good definition? Is there a better definition? I think that's that's a little bit of a question. I don't know if I answered your, your question here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know either. Yeah, 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 I see. I see. And, uh, and this, uh, and this piece was linear map on, on the cones, uh, uh, doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with, uh, with tangent product operation on crystals or. Oh, it is, it is, of course. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a product, uh, uh, it's probably you, you, you make some kind of continuous version of crystals mm -hmm. and that's that that will be on calls that will be exactly that or right so on the one hand representation theorists are doing it but then I, I don't know whether you are aware there is a whole school of probabilists which study stochastic processes on cones mm -hmm. and uh, so 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 they are um i think they're doing something like this uh i forgot they are they're probably taking some kind of small uh small polytop inside the cone and then they they multiply you, they you take a point here in the cone and you you multiply many times and you're trying to organize a stochastic process mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think there are, I think it's called the RSK, right? There is this RSK combinatorics. 
and they are producing RSK stochastic processes in integral probability on the cone. So that that's that will also be the same map. Uh -huh, I see. Uh -huh. Right. Oh, okay. So you mean that the, the cone is a polyhedral realization of a, of a crystal when, when, the yes. weight, when the highest weight goes to infinity and, and this, this should be? Uh, maybe, no, 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 I think, uh, I think the cone is what is called this extended string cone. So you have, uh, you have there crystals for all highest weights. Uh, for all possible highest weights. Yeah, yeah, for all possible <laughs> highest weights. Remember the picture that um jeremy was uh, drawing right so yeah. so he had that picture in colors I, I okay i i don't want to do it in colors but and there they were there were those uh, red lines right so that i think that would be a crystal which uh, so this would be highest weight and then for each highest weight there would be uh, a polytope or integral points in a polytop. So which would be uh, the crystal basis and the corresponding finite, finite dimensional representation. Uh, so you mean that each individual crystal is a section of this cone? Yes, right? yes. An individual crystal is a section uh, by some kind of hyperplane of this cone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I see, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, people, yeah, thanks, so. thanks, thanks a lot for staying with me. Uh, well, I don't know whether there are any other questions. Are there any other questions? Well, th uh, thank you very much, Anton, for re uh, really, yeah. really fantastic, very good person. Oh, yeah. You're very kind, so thanks a lot. And um, yeah, to mention again, so tomorrow Shao Meng will be uh, so, uh, continuing the girlfriend side and story. Yeah, so tomorrow actually we have three lectures. Mm -hmm. First will be Misha Berstein on uh, on on two thirty, and uh, then there will be Shao Meng Shu uh, continuing this course and. Uh, and also seeing something from his point of view. And uh, and the last lecture will, will be given by Bora Fagin on, uh, so it will be on six. What, what is the time of examining you? Excuse to... uh, the time, uh, well, uh, uh, the, uh, so Xiaomiang will be on, uh, on 4.15. Okay, thanks. As usual. Yeah. Okay. So, so see you. Thanks. Thanks, and hopefully see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye.